All right, let's do this. Last time we got through chapters four, five, and six in Ulysses, and remember the basic outline of Ulysses. There are three parts. There is uh, there are the journeys of Telemachus, the Telemachus, the Telemachi, or the Telemachia. Then there are the journeys of Odysseus, uh, Ulysses, which is uh, uh, Bloom, and then there are the so-called Gnostos. Within those divisions, there are further subdivisions. The first three chapters are the chapters of of Stephen Davis. The next three chapters are chapters that focus on Bloom. Seventh chapter is the first time that we have a chapter in which both are featured prominently and are like protagonist and deuteragonist. Uh, but uh, the two of our main characters cross paths. Bloom will again see Stephen, see that he has very nice shoes on, but hasn't kept them very clean. Notice this about her snickety Bloom. She, even though we get to see him do very fairly vulgar things like use the restroom, onanism, ogle a lady or two or three. He cares about clean eating and keeping oneself clean as well. So I say he's a little bit persnickety. In any case, chapter seven is called Eolus, and it features two newspapers, and one the Freeman's Journal, the other the Evening Telegraph, which is edited by one blustering alcoholic, Miles Crawford. And in fact, I'm not going to say a tremendous amount about this chapter, except for to talk about its form and the way in which it is modern, and also talk a little bit about the aesthetic experience of reading a chapter, which features not only two main characters, but one who comes from the Northeast, one, or excuse me, from the Northwest, one from the Southeast, and they meet at the center, at the heart of the Hibernian metropolis. Hibernia is a, a Latin name for Ireland. And so in the heart of the Hibernian metropolis exist these two newspapers. And this is where Stephen and Leopold Bloom also uh, creating a sense of expectancy and longing in us. They just pass each other by. We've been waiting for them finally to meet each other and speak and see what it is they have to say to each other. And yet we are still going to be wanting when it comes to this desire. In any case, this chapter plays with, as I promised I would say, this chapter plays with form. Features more than 60, in fact, 63, though I counted 62, but I must have counted it correctly. Newspaper headlines. What's worse than reading a newspaper uh, headline when you're trying to read a novel? Something about reading novels is that they try to draw you in. They try to uh, make your perception part of the story itself. In fact, you may have experienced before that you're reading very closely, so you may tap you on the shoulder and you kind of, you know, jump, you start because you were in sucked in. It was an engaging piece of literature. What is the effect of having headline after headline after headline after headline you're reading for just a second? Boom, headline. What does that do to your experience of reading? It pulls you out. It lets you know that you're reading. There's an artificiality to it. This is part of something that uh, Joyce is claiming about the news. That even though it tells you the things that happen during the course of the day, that it is artificial. Um, and that it, it tries to make a headline of that which is not true news. And so uh, what, what do I mean by saying, well, look at the contrast between what James Joyce is trying to accomplish through Ulysses and what one tries to accomplish through the news, through, through offering something that might be uh, as, as worthwhile or as useful or as valuable as hot air. Um, uh, and, and just talking about things that seem to pass by. But Ulysses is the story of a single day, right? And all of these details and bits of characterization, like learning that Mina Purifoy is a woman who's been uh, in labor for three days. This is the sort of detail that adds weight and gravity to this text. We see all of these characters in the text having their day, and yet we realize that there is so much more to them than that which is just happening. For example, Bloom and Molly. All that is happening on this day is a direct result of what their relationship has become over 10 years of estrangement after the death of their son. This is just the day when things are culminating. It's like cancer, right? Uh, once one knows that one has cancer, one, particularly if it's something like stage four, cancer, terminal cancer, one has had cancer for some time. It has been building in one, regardless of what it is. So James Joyce is doing, in some ways, the opposite of newspaper. He is showing that which truly matters in a day. He is giving the details of a day, which give you a substantial view into the character 
of the souls of the individuals that he's representing, as well as the character of the city and the nation that he is representing, Dublin and Ireland as well. His inverse claim then would be that the best way not to know a people would be to read their news. And because that is when the things that they think are important are shared, but are not truly uh, characteristic of the people themselves. That news is ultimately one of the more artificial forms of, of conveying information to individuals. In fact, and you might find this a crazy, crazy claim, he seems to be suggesting that literature, and in particular, his literature, which is so indecipherable, is of greater value for understanding Irish people than reading the actual newspapers present in Ireland at his time, even though these are, of course, uh, fictional representations that are based on real newspapers at his time. Um, if you ever study Ulysses more and more and more, you'll see that many of the characters that are brought up are based on uh, actual characters. Uh, John Henry Minton, for example, is based on a character named John Henry Minton with an I uh, instead of an O at the end of the day. So literally one letter is changed about his name, and that might have been a misspelling. Um, so I, I encourage you to see the contrast between literary forms here and what the novelist, James Joyce, is attempting to say about the newspaper. Keep in mind also that these newspaper men, that Miles Crawford says, you can do it, to Stephen Dedalus. He's trying to recruit him to, uh, to tell the news, to be a news person. But again, if it is Stephen Dedalus's um, personal moral responsibility to his people and to his own ability to create the uncreated consciousness of his people, well, being a history teacher is a problem, right? You teach fact, facts about the past. You don't create new uh, a, a new piece of art that ennobles and transforms the soul of one's people by teaching history. Often, perhaps there's some really great history teachers out there. Well, how is being a newspaper person also a problem for an artist? Well, think about it. It, it, it too is artificial, like art, art, artificial. You see that art is part of the very term of it. Uh, and official comes from facio to make, to make by art. But to write the news is not to truly be creative. It is to report in a formulaic way that which people, to some extent, already expect to hear. To transform people through literature, one has to express that which is unexpected or difficult to see without the presence of your art. Good literature, great literature, should shine a light on something about people and about a people that they often do not term towards that particular aspect of themselves, like notes from the underground, or notes from underground, for example, where we see the inner monologue of this ugly character that we think is totally disgusting, and then we realize, goodness, I've had half of these thoughts in the last seven days. Oh, am I like this character? Am I, too, an underground man? This would make even more sense if we were in the basement of Alan where it's like, uh, without any windows, and if we were dark, it would, be, it would be gnarly. And so to become a newspaper person, he would join a corpse, Stephen, and he would again be uh, sharing something that is not unique to him, but is, is more of a common um, and uh, already stereotyped form. And so to be a newspaper person would be a, a relegation of duty for him as an artist. And, and I will make a similar point when and he speaks in the National Library to the Irish nationalists to take a propagandistic perspective um, and to have a propagandistic um, goal for his art would again to be transforming his art into, uh, into something which is used for political means rather than to truly uh, reveal, uncover, and perhaps create a new spirit of his people. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Perhaps that will be a harder point to make. In any case, I, I suppose I should have said a little bit about Aeolus. The Aeolus episode in Homer's Odyssey comes in book 10. Notice that this is an inversion by Joyce of the normal uh, linearity, uh, or excuse me, the normal structure of the Odyssey, where Hades comes in book 11. Um, Aeolus comes in book 10. So Joyce has inverted the order of these episodes. Hades comes in chapter 6, Aeolus comes in chapter 7 whereas uh, Hades comes in book 11 in the Odyssey, and Yolas comes in book 10, which is very modern, so people are thinking about 
There Odysseus meets the god of winds who gives Odysseus all the winds in the world except for the west wind to be used to push him along all the way to Ithaca. He spends a month with this king. Interesting note about this king. So he has six daughters, six sons. They're all married to each other. This suggests to us that they are divine. In the ancient world, uh, the gods are allowed to commit incest, Hera and Zeus, for example. And if you think of Egyptian pharaohs, you might see that they must have seen themselves as divine in some way, and so they are able to uh, engage in this practice. So, uh, sad for them, like with the Hopsburgs, perhaps there is a curse attached to such an irrigation of divinity. Uh, as we know, genetics catch up with um, the, the ancestors. As it so uh, think one is divine, think that you are divine at your own risk, I, I would say. In any case, Odysseus then leaves with his men with this bag makes it all the way to Ithaca. He can see the fires, he can smell the fires. I don't know how many of you are woods people, but fire, especially campfire, has a very distinct smell. And if it's related to home, you smell it, and the memories rush in, you can just imagine their home. And at this moment, Odysseus falls asleep. He's too tired. He's been manning the steer, he's been steering uh, the ship for days without sleep. And so he's basically home. He's, he's there, right? The job is done. Fall asleep. Mm. And this is an important thing to keep in mind uh, that the job is not done until the job is truly done. Odysseus's men, seeing that he is asleep, look at the bag. There must be some untold amount of wealth in there. Obviously, Odysseus wants to keep it for himself. So let's open it. Open the bag of wind. The winds escape. They blow them all the way back to Yola. Odysseus begs, please give me the winds again. He says, no, you're cursed. Absolutely not. You, um, you need to go on. Uh, you need to go on with yourself, as, as we might say, to make that a transitive verb with an object. Um, and so, and so, the guiltless episode is an episode of almost making it home, but not quite having enough physical stamina to do it and to go from being almost exactly where one wanted to be and to achieve one's greatest desire and to be blown all the way back to the start. It's an author. I encourage you to look to see whether such an experience exists within chapter 7 of Ulysses. Is there a getting blown away back to the start element of this? Hmm. Ladies, let me say a couple of things uh, uh, about Miles Crawford and about Bloom, all, again showing his practical intelligence and desire to get things done in the way of prejudicial alcoholics, and in this case, uh, an actual prejudicial alcoholic, um, uh, uh, perhaps a prefiguration of the cyclopean citizen whom we have read about but have not yet lectured about. So, Bloom has a client, he's an advertising person named Alexander Keyes. Alexander Keyes has a proposition for Miles Crawford. I will take out an advertisement in your uh, evening telegraph for two more months if you write a short puff piece. Do you know what a puff piece is? Puff piece is a piece compliment, not really investigated here. So it would, it would be like if I wrote a recommendation for you. It's a puff piece, right? I'm not saying, well, you got A and then you got B, and this is really a good analysis of your character. I'm like, you're the greatest for these reasons. Um, and this is a pretty reasonable request of one. Just, you know, a paragraph of puff. For this one individual, it makes a lot of sense to me. And yet, Miles Crawford showing his opinion of Bloom, uh, he, he blows Bloom away by, by telling him uh, in no uncertain terms, he can kiss my royal Irish boss. Very professional of him. Before going off to have a liquid lunch, this is a lunch in which you drink instead of eating, drink alcohol. Uh, with Stephen Davis. Um, as I said, uh, this is the first chapter after chapters one to three and three to six, where Bloom and Stephen are featured prominently together rather than one or the other. Note that Bloom is coming east to do his job, even though Stephen is done with his job for the day. Remember, he has a short day by 9 to 3 a.m. Uh, pretty nice day of teaching, I would say. Um, and while Stephen is done working for the day, he must deliver Mr. Deasy's letter to the editor of the Telegraph on put on hook and mouth disease. So he's still running errands for individuals. And notice also that running errands is something a little bit inappropriate to his artistic endeavors. This takes time. 
takes energy. It's time and energy that he's not working on his art. So you'll notice that all day long, things are happening to Stephen to pull him away from what it is that he truly desires to do. Um, though the two do not interact, uh, Bloom does notice Stephen and his boots, as I mentioned, which are borrowed from Doug Mulligan. And he knows that they're not very kept up, that they're a little bit muddy. And this tells us something about both the paternalism of Bloom observing Stephen, remembering the last time he had seen Stephen, this is prior to uh, him having seen him during the 80s episode, and also, to some extent, criticizing Stephen. He's got some nice boots on, but not keeping them very clean, which is itself a uh, reviewing of uh, Bloom's like for cleanliness, but also a sort of paternal judgment on this young man who is not, uh, who is not uh, as clean as he could be, is not as sane or sanitary as he could be. All right, I'm going to talk as much about Lestergonians as I can in just a few minutes. Chapter 8 is Lestergonian. It's about eating and being consumed. I want you to really think about what it means to be consumed in our own parlance, right? To be consumed has a literal meaning, but if you're consumed by something, the past participle is used as an adjective, uh, attended to your, or attributed to your character. When you're consumed by something, this tends to be obsession, right? Mental. Something, something's eating away at you is how we talk about this. And so I encourage you to see Bloom being eaten away at by various forces. Gaze is boiling, for example, and the notion that his wife is about to make a cuckold of him, but then also um, the interactions that he has with others, and also, of course, notice the physical eating that happens in this chapter. Bloom will treat himself to a gorgonzola cheese sandwich and a glass of burgundy, it's a bit of a refined thing to have if everybody else is having beer around him or shots of whiskey as they are. And uh, this tells you a little bit about uh, the sophistication of Bloom in relation to his, many of his comments. Uh, the beginning of the chapter starts with pineapple rock. See already on the very first word of referenced food, even though not the rock though, also very important to the Lestergonians, I'll mention that in a moment. Lemon black, butterscotch, food, food, food. A sugar sticky girl shoveling scoopfuls of greens for a Christian brother. Some school treat. Bad for their tummies, lozenge and compute manufacturer to his majesty the king. God save our no king. This is the British king who lives in England, not the Irish king. Sitting on his throne, sucking red jujubes white. Jujubes are Chinese names, by the way. All right, so that's very interesting. I think that's a very telling first uh, sentence or two uh, to orient us with the Lester of in Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus and his companions reach the city of Talipolos, uh, which is the city of Les the Lestragonians. There, um, 11 of the 12 ships of Odysseus uh, moor themselves in the harbor. He moors himself slightly outside. He sends men to the city. On the way there, they encounter a young girl. She takes the men to the, the citadel of the city where they encounter a giant woman which screams and then a giant man with several other giant men run after them. These men, uh, creatures, uh, these large, gigantic cannibal creatures, um, who are often represented as having brown fur in a very simian way, um, then use uh, rocks and spears to destroy 11 out of 12 of Odysseus's ships. Every single man he has dies right then and there, except for the ones on his particular ship. It's extremely violent episode. It's a very short, Episode. And it's an episode that many people who read the Odyssey forget. They'll remember the Cyclopes episode, where only something like six or seven people die. I think six. He kills two people at the time, I think three times. Um, everybody remembers that. It's a longer episode. And yet the Lystragones, where everybody, where everybody dies, basically, doesn't get as much love. Interesting. In any case, we observe Bloom's uh, we observe Bloom's eating habits. And these seem to be very important to him. They're very important to Odysseus as well. His observations and judgments of the inhabitants of others, he prefers clean eaters and himself enjoys wine. Uh, Bloom also sees poor Dilly Daedalus. He thinks she must be selling furniture uh, in order to make money for this now uh, widowed family of, of the Daedalus. If you remember, their mother has just. Uh, he has an interaction with one of uh, Nay, Josie Powell, now Mrs. Brain, his former girlfriend. 
When they speak of the Nina Pure Court, look at the degree of detail and characterization in realism. A former girlfriend of this, who's now called Mrs. Brady, uh, who is talking about a woman who has been in labor for three days. This is absorbing. This absorbs one in two. This seems like a real situation. There's a little bit of insight into Bloom and Molly's romantic life. Um, I'll just mention here that uh, we, we hear that Bloom, Molly, and Boylan were walking together after a performance, and Bloom noticed that they kept touching. Boylan and his wife, there were signs. They would rub up against each other, that they had some affection for each other. He started to suspect and to see. And then he even sees uh, ooh, uh, we finally get here in chapter eight the reason why he is a stranger from Molly. He spies Bob Dorn bobbing through the street on a bender, drinking bender, then returns to his thought that he was happier then, harkening back to the previous decade, 10 years ago, 10 years, five months, 18 days, in fact, uh, to the era prior to the loss of Rudy, could never like it again after Rudy. This is uh, copulation coitus with his wife. Hinting towards what we shall learn about the Bloom marriage in the Ithaca episode, which is that it's been 10 years since they have been together. After seeing the disgusting eating in the Burns room, he turns to Davy Burns' so called moral hub, which he believed correctly. And there he has to talk to Nosy Flank, who asks him again, very similar to McCoy earlier, who's getting it up. Who's getting it up? The same person that, uh, that Bloom sees at the end of the chapter and has a physical reaction to. Who does it see in tan shoes and indigo? Jacket and straw hat and rose in his mouth. He sees what is for it. it. It's around 2 p.m. here. Two hours this guy is going, right? Actually, it, it, yeah, it's around 2 p.m. at this point, at the end of the chapter. This guy is about to go sleep with Bloom's wife. Can you imagine having to go talk to that man and exchange pleasantries with him? Oh, hey, Blazes. Yeah, I know. Really looking forward to you getting it up with my, I mean, going on this tour with my wife. And hope you, oh, you're meeting her today. That's great. Hope you have a good time. You see why this would be insufferable for him. And so he avoids it. He tries to act as if he, like a tourist, is just enjoying the sights of the museum. And then he goes in to look at uh, Venus's May Seals work uh, crafted for him. So that's how uh, chapter eight and this lecture ends.